Hello. Uh, thanks for coming to see me this ungodly hour. Uh, it's not ungodly, but I left Glasgow at like seven. So, um, so this is actually AAA to indie, but the projectors cut off the first day, so the game's not as good anymore. <laughs> it's just double A. Um, uh, this was going to be titled uh, Using the Exhausting Lessons Learned Out of a Decade of Pure Despair to Get a Game Greenlit. <laughs> but I felt because it was the first one of the day that was a bit too negative. So now it's taking the best practices of large scale development and give your indie endeavor the best chance of success. Um, and what I'm really wanting to get across here is um, over, over the years, um, I've worked in AAA and, um, and now run a studio for the last couple of years. And there's always been this kind of indie versus AAA attitude that's kind of that's kind of grated a little bit because there's a lot to learn from both parts. And some people kind of dismiss AAA because it's like a big factory business, and some people dismiss indie because it's not big enough. And and I've been lucky enough to sample both and kind of learn what I can from both. Um, the the lessons that I've learned, I'm kind of applying here specifically to. Um, kind of pre-production and planning and um, getting your game greenlit rather than uh, like how to do QA or how to manage a team of 20 people or whatever. Um, so a quick bit about me, um, I'm John. Um, so I'm the creative director and founder of No Code. Um, I founded that about two years ago, two and a half years ago now, and we're still going, which is lovely. Um, we started off as two people and we're now 10 people. Um, so things have been going well. Um, that's me drinking an empty mug of tea. Um, so I was a motion graphic designer before I started. Um, I was doing motion graphics and graphic design for a couple of years before I got into UI um, in the games industry. Haven't slept much since. Um, won some BAFTA stuff. Um, I'm kind of most known for my artwork on Alien Isolation, where I was the art lead on presentation in UI. Um, and I also then became lead designer on all the DLC, which kind of led to what I'm doing now, where I got to manage a small team and realize that I like that kind of stuff. Um, and the kind of big game that we've recently launched is Stories Untold, where I was the writer, director, and weirdly actor, which came out of nowhere. Um, some of the games I've worked on, hey, there's APB, classic. Um, and this is a quick trailer, if it will work, of Stories Untold. I know you're tearing yourself apart over it. But no matter what you keep telling yourself, you have to listen to me. Right, Mr. Asian, now are you ready? I know how difficult this must be, but you can do this. Well, would you look at that? It seems we have a pulse. It's above me. It's above me. They're here. Be ready. All of you. So we brought that game out um, in the February, end of February this year. Um, and I firmly believe we would never have shipped it if I hadn't learned what I'd learned in AAA because we used a lot of the practices in order to deliver it. Um, we made it in a super short time. It was like six months, um, which the initial proposal seemed like a doable thing. And what we ended up building was probably more like a year condensed down and we worked crazy hours and all that kind of stuff. But um, yeah. So yeah, so transferable experience. The thing is, is like, like I say, a lot of the things we've learned in AAA we've been able to apply. Um, they feel really different for anyone who's, who's kind of worked in teams of 100, 200 plus um, and has worked on their own or as a group of four or whatever. Um, they feel really different, but the concepts are still the same and that, that's kind of what I want to drive at. Um, some things don't directly transfer because of the nature of the game or the size of the team, like um, contingency planning or coordinating you know, a team of 30 artists or whatever. But the concepts of those practices are still the same. You're still catastrophizing. You're still trying to work out what can go wrong and how to kind of mitigate that. You're still, um, you're still managing your resources as best you can, whether it's a 30-man team and you've got lots of people to work with and you're having to you know, organize that and keep on top of that, which is a difficult task, or it's a four-person team and you've got not much resource and so you need to be very efficient with it. So, 
there's definitely a, a parallel there. Um, it's just a scaling issue and then the, the kind of nature of the team shape that would kind of change at that point. Um, so this is about firm ideas um, and how to understand and develop your game concept um, and using the practices that have come from kind of AAA. Um, so when I worked on the Alien Isolation, there was an awful lot of um, demos being produced and you know, uh, work going into kind of proving what our idea was to the team, to the publishers, to 20th Century Fox, all these people to try and work out exactly what this game was before we spent like 50 million pounds on it or whatever it was. Um, so even though the story's untold and, and the games that we're currently making are nowhere near that kind of budget level, uh, the same practice of making sure you're making the right thing and that people understand what it is you're trying to make is still mega important. Um, so the first thing is like, you've got to understand what it is you're trying to make uh, and what it is you're trying to do. Um, and to begin with, I, I, you know, we always built a demo rather than a full game. We didn't try and sell people like an entire thing, like a 100 page design doc. It was build a demo, build something that kind of demonstrates the best parts of your idea. Um, the, the big reason for this, uh, as I found working with um, Sega, Fox, and, and people who are not um, directly involved in game development um, in terms of like actually, you know, at the coalface, um, imagination and interpretation of what you're saying can vary wildly. So when you explain your idea, when you tell them your idea, they're using all these other preconceptions and experiences in their head to come up with what they think you're talking about, and they will not be the same. You know, even within a team, you can explain something to someone and have them explain it back to you, and it'll be very different. Um, so demos and um, uh, like documentation and videos and proof of concept stuff can feel like not making the game because it's something else and you're just trying to prove a point. But in order to get funding, in order to uh, understand and get a team kind of on board with what it is you're trying to build, they're absolutely essential. Um, so I, I've always kind of championed this idea of building an idea rather than just having one. Um, loads of people have ideas and that's great, but um, actually building upon that with people is a completely different skill from working on your own. Um, Obviously, a lot of this is related to like commercial game development rather than um, you know self projects, you know stuff you're working on in your own time. But um, converting a, an, an idea into something that's tangible requires a lot of different skills and often a lot of different people with different backgrounds. Um, so what we would do is we we would start off with something. You know, we'd have our idea for for stories untold. It was a, an a inverse nostalgia thing. It was a text adventure. Reborn um, for Alien Isolation, it was we want to make uh, get back to the roots of the original franchise, and we want to you know capture what made that original film so special that's never been captured in a game before. So we had that was our idea, and we thought that's a good idea. We should do that, but you have to kind of break that down and understand why it's a good idea, what it is you're trying to achieve, um, and then once you've kind of sussed that out, is build upon that, is is find the things that exemplify that as best as possible. Um, so it's finding the hooks of your game and helping them stand out. So example, um, The House Abandoned, which was the kind of demo we produced that became Stories Untold. Um, we had this concept of taking nostalgia and flipping it on its head. Nostalgia is often seen as a very safe thing and a very happy thing. And we wanted to kind of turn that around so that nostalgia would be something that wasn't safe and wasn't happy and kind of rebel a bit against what was kind of or what still is currently kind of in vogue. Um, we had the idea that you'd play a text adventure, but we would evolve it so the text adventure would spill out into the world, and that was kind of the main hook, was that this text adventure wasn't limited to text. It would start to affect things and systems in other ways. So that kind of surprise, that kind of narrative idea became like the selling point, and so when we made that demo, it was all about doubling down on that and doing whatever we could that to demonstrate that concept. So the narrative changed, the presentation changed, the style, um, everything was kind of based around this principle um, on this well, story within a story and nostalgia being weird. Um, 
So it ended up going from a full screen text adventure to being a text adventure that you play on a screen and at a desk. And gradually things start to kind of happen in the world around the machine as well as on the machine. And we were just trying to find all the different ways that we could uh, sell that concept uh, in that demo. So it was a 20 minute demo for most people to play, which is a little bit long for like a publisher demo, but it, it got the point across. And we then took that demo to Devolver and they loved it and they signed the full game on the back of it um, because it was such a clear kind of example of what we were trying to achieve. Um, so one of the things that we did as part of that process that um, was a huge, huge point in all the way through development of Alien and all of our games is this concept of pillars. And a lot of people might be familiar with it um, if, you've, if you've worked in big studios, but the idea is that you're looking to create uh, or come up with a couple of kind of key statements or phrases that summarize the strongest parts of your game. And these are the things that you'll measure everything against. Um, an example was Alien Isolation had lo-fi sci-fi. Um, that was one of the phrases that was used constantly. It was a strong pillar of a game, and what we would do is use that is to measure game mechanics, uh, visuals, whatever, we measured against that. Does it fit this mold? Does it fit lo-fi sci-fi? So a designer might pitch a level where there's a, a hologram. You know, it's like, oh, you go up to this hologram and you do a puzzle, and then you would measure that against this pillar and go, well, that doesn't feel lo-fi, that feels hi-fi, so how do, we, how do we twist that into something that is more in keeping with the franchise and more in keeping with that pillar? Um, stories Untold, the kind of first pillar was four stories, one nightmare, which is a bit of like a marketing slogan-ish thing, but it helped guide Devolver, helped guide the guys in the team on what it was we were trying to do, is that we were making four short stories, but they weren't all completely different. They weren't like Black Mirror or Twilight Zone where they feel unique and each one is a completely different experience. We still wanted this idea that there was a cohesive narrative, that there was a flow, that when you play them in order, you discover things. So that became our benchmark. That became the thing that we measured stuff against. You know, does the thing that happens in episode four feel like it still belongs in this game because of that? Um, if we had said four stories, four adventures, or four stories, four tales, or anything like that, it would conjure up completely different imagery to a publisher or to anyone else in your team. It would wildly differentiate that game from what we did produce. Um, so something as simple as that can have a marked effect on even just, like, say, within your team, you've got, like, we had four people full-time working on that game with a couple of extra guys helping out, um, trying to keep people understanding what your weird little game is. Uh, is really important because people start making random stuff and kind of end up wasting time or that kind of thing. So the Pillars was a, a great way of getting Devolver and the, the publishers on board. Um, when we showed the game to Steam, they kind of got it because we showed them a demo and, and we gave them these Pillars, we said them out loud, we, we let them into that part of the process. Um, so then it came to actually producing a demo. Um, so if you've worked in Big, I don't want to say AAA all the time, but like big scale development, you've probably made a lot of demos and you've probably been really frustrated with it. Because um, like I said earlier, it doesn't feel like making the game. You feel like you're wasting time on something because all you're trying to do is prove a point to someone. Um, the thing is, is that they're absolutely essential and it's really frustrating when, for me when people get upset about making demos because I think there's just a, a little bit of short-sightedness about what they really mean and what they unlock, um, usually money. Um, usually the ability to keep making that game. Um, whether it's a vertical slice or a publisher-facing demo or all these kind of things, they're still pivotal. What they're trying to do is convince someone to buy your game and pay for your game, whether that's a customer or a publisher or a platform holder, is to get them to want more. It's to say, well, you liked what you saw, now you want to have more of it and you, know, you want to pay for more of that. Um, it also helps, you know, pull a team together to understand what that goal is because throughout the process, you know, for me, so I'm the, the creative director at No Code and I've got these ideas floating around in my head about what I want to produce, but it's hard to articulate them without actually just building the thing. And when you've got 10 people to coordinate, you can't just say, go build it. You have to find out ways to communicate that. Um, so the demo builds are a pivotal part of that because you take something very small, a very small but pivotal part of your game and work that through 
And that's the thing. It's kind of like working out your pillars in game form. You're trying to work out what can illustrate your concept as best as possible. Um, and yeah, without demos, most of the games you played would never get, you'd never play them because they would never get there. Because they unlock money, they unlock milestone cash, um, they get projects signed, uh, they get people to buy it because they play it at a show floor on, at Res or whatever. Um, so they're super important. Um, and one of the, the biggest things that I've picked up from my time working in that environment was the importance of these demos and how they were built, how they flow. Um, as I say, you're trying to make something that demonstrates your game concept and your pillars as quickly as possible. Um, you know, we produced demos on Alien that only took six weeks. You know, for a game of the, the scope we were doing was crazy. Um, you're trying to do it as effectively as possible for as little cash as possible. And you're trying to work out a flow that teaches people what the game is step by step. And I've been to countless trade shows and played lots of games and I always like to see how other people present stuff. And it's really frustrating when you go up to play a game that looks interesting from afar and probably is really interesting. But when you go up to play it, someone hits you with like a wall of noise about what the game is and how it's played and what the controls are and so on and so forth. And don't let you experience it. They don't let you have any of that discovery for yourself. And it's a really important part of getting people to invest in what you've done uh, is to feel like they've had an experience there and not just been told what the game is. Um, there's some great examples out there of this being done well. Um, one that springs to mind is uh, Bioshock, which is Bioshock Infinite and Bioshock the first one were both great examples of how that pulls together, um, how you can teach people flow, teach them mechanics and have them lead on to new mechanics. Um, and so the last thing um, is streamlining the demo and kind of engineering the demo is presenting it as part of a bigger thing, alludes to other mechanics. So we, a lot of people get in think we, we're doing bad things when you're making demos that don't have finished mechanics and you show them and people get frustrated if that mechanic's different in the final game but what you're trying to do in those points is illustrate the bigger picture without having to make it all because otherwise you'd have to wait till the game is finished and it's too late. So you're kind of in a situation where you have to convey all this extra stuff that makes it work without having to actually spend the money to build it. Um, so you think about your controls, your UI, um, you think about how people are introduced to those mechanics um, allow, each t allow time for each concept to sink in, let them discover it, and then play test a lot. Um, something that gets taken very seriously in big scale development is play testing is watching people play. We used to you know, capture the screen while people played Alien and also film them while they played so we could see whether they were getting frustrated and we could see how their, their facial expressions would change when something happened. Not just to watch them get scared, which was also fun, but to see how they struggled with the puzzle and we could like match up what they were doing in the game with how they were shifting around in their seat. And it's not expensive to do that. It's, it seems like a big endeavor, but it's not really like you can get your friends and you can get your family and you can get people from the, the industry to, to come by and play a demo and don't be afraid to show it off and just say, do you mind if I film this and see what you get from it? And you learn so much from it. Um, and. Uh, the, the final kind of part of that is, is going to trade shows, um, which if you've never done EGX or any of these kind of things is like highly recommended. Um, you get to watch hundreds of people play your game and you come away from that experience. Like you're not selling copies of your game, that's not the point. Is if you're in development is you're seeing real people play this game for real and discovering what's wrong with your game in like sharp focus because it's very apparent when a hundred people all struggle at the same puzzle that that's a bad idea or no one gets that they can press a certain button to open a menu. It's, it becomes immediately apparent and you would, it would take a long time to get there in-house and um, to actually do that via a, a playtest session or, um, or a, a trade show floor is just fundamental to user experience. Um, so last thing, um, the additional materials, these are things that we would often have to submit to Sega or um, whatever publisher you're working with, Devolver, um, hinting at the process that you take, the, the way that you build the games. Um, we'd make short compilation videos of us making the game because it helped build confidence in the publisher to show that we knew what we were doing. Um, and we'd be able to explain the decisions that we've made. So some things that might seem a bit obtuse or seem bizarre, we'd be able to explain it. And the idea that we always had was we'd think, right, 
you know, what are Sega going to ask when we show them this demo? What are the things they're going to get confused about? What are Devolver going to ask when we show them this weird bit of gameplay? And try and answer them in advance, either in the demo or in additional materials. Try and think about what they're going to do. Um, I honestly think without doing those things, we would never have shipped Alien or Stories Untold or the game we're currently working on. We've used this process even just to get it signed. Um, it's, it's, it's a a big endeavor that I think a lot of people don't take seriously enough, and um, you can do a lot by, uh, by paying a lot of attention to building those demos and building those examples. So, awesome. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.